Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Teresa Calvano. I'm director at Ruth Pedersen. I'm delighted to welcome you today to hear the presentation of the EULITICS uh, European Parliament Report 2021. So greetings to all of those of you who are connected online and uh, to the, I think, 15 COVID-safe people who are with us in the room. Um, obviously, a warm welcome to our speakers. It is nice, I have to say, from a moderation point of view, to be able to see you in the eyes for a change. And um, here we go, let's start. I think this will be a really exciting event. I think we'll have a nice hour ahead of us. And the reason is that when I think of big data, data analytics, I think uh, of two concepts. One is uh, the impact of big data on commercial world. And the second is uh, the political campaigning. So how do we analyze voters and voters' <coughs> um, voting behavior? I have to say, to be honest, in the uh, policy making uh, world, we've been a bit behind, but Eulytics have broken this trend. So the methodology and the depth of the insight of Eulytics is the most advanced we've seen in our world. And this is why we, as Ruth Pedersen, are really proud and happy to be able to partner with you, Attila and team, uh, and launch this report. Uh, before we move to the presentation of the report, uh, I'll just do quick introductions. Um, so we have Attila Kovacs. He's the founder and managing director of Eulytics, the new EU big data company he'll talk about. And by the way, uh, for those of you who haven't realized, Eulytics come from EU and analytics, Eulytics. Then we have uh, Mr. Dragos Pislaru, so Romanian MEP from Renew Europe. You are a member of the Employment and Social Affairs Committee, and we shall see a key profile in the findings of the report. And last but not least, we have Andras Bennett, Senior Advisor for the Public Affairs Council, which is the leading organization representing the public affairs industry in Brussels and Washington, D.C., uh, you are here with us, uh, Andras, to give us the public affairs perspective. So, to kick us off, uh, Attila will summarize the methodology, mainly the findings, uh, over the next 10-15 minutes, before we go into the panel discussion and questions. I know, uh, Mr. Pizzolaro, you'll have to leave us at 1.30 to go back to the Parliament, actually doing the things we'll discuss in the report, in the findings. So, we'll uh, just have to keep up the pace. Attila, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I would like to welcome everyone here in the room and over the, the broadcasting. Let me start my presentation. Um, and let me, start, uh, let me start with a personal note. Some years ago, when I did my doctoral dissertation, I started to deal with legislative amendments in the European Parliament. And uh, besides the scientific use of the bunch of data that are publicly available in the European Parliament, I started to think whether it could be used for some other purposes, including public affairs consultancy. After this discussion, I managed to find the right people and the right team, and today we are here to present you our main findings. And today is the day of the release, as we could hear, of the second annual report of the European Parliament 2021. Many people can say, what's the weather like today? It's enough just to take a look out of the window, classic Brussels weather. But not many are able to say what the weather will be like at the end of the weekend. And what the future of EU Lytics and what the mission of EU Lytics is, is to be able to predict the legislative activity and legislative power of the members of the European Parliament the legislative power of the EP groups, the legislative power of national delegations, the, national, the um, predictive power of member states. That's the potential of the data we have. And let me give you some highlights and some insights where we are on this road that is ahead of us. Yes, in the report that is already downloadable from the website of EULITICS, EULITICS.EU, we made three categories, legislative activity, legislative connectivity, and legislative heterogeneity. I will talk about the methodology in more detail in a couple of slides, but you can see these three types of ranking, and one aggregate ranking, which is applied merging in these three rankings together. Why these three rankings? Social network analysis is a methodological tool that is on the upward track using in 
social science and already in legislative politics. We are talking le about legislative politics in here. And what we have seen is that those indices applied in social network analysis are in connection with the legislative success and might be able to predict the legislative outcome of, uh, of individual MEPs uh, as I talked about it. What data we have? Data is always crucial in the analysis. We are primarily concentrating on legislative amendments. The second report is based on almost 100,000 legislative amendments. This is the annual productivity, if I may say so, of the European Parliament. But we do have already voting data in the European Parliament, voting data in the Council, which might be also channeled into a more comprehensive analysis. And what the novelty is that the, once the methodology, be it social network analysis, mathematical modeling, machine learning, is something that we see a market niche for here in Brussels. There are already big data companies. We also keep an eye on the United States to, to get ideas about the potential use of, of advanced methodology and big data in political science and legislative politics. But we do believe that in Europe, in Brussels, there is still room for development. Legislative activity. I may say the easiest um, index or ranking of the report, based on the number of amendments, that the MEPs are signing, or the number of amendments the MEPs are co-sponsoring. Obviously, more MEPs can, can jointly co-sponsor the legislative amendments. And this is weighted by the number of MEPs who co-sign uh, the, uh, the amendment that we are talking about. The second category, the second pillar, is connectivity. Here you can see the visualization of the current uh, European Parliament. Very beautifully, the, the main groups, the main EP groups are separated, but there are the crucial, the critical members who are connecting the EP groups. It's easy for us to identify who are those bridges. So in connectivity, in social network, there are some indices, there are some measures uh, which can say who are the most influential, critical players in the network and that position is in line with the legislative uh, success in the European Parliament. And last but not least, somehow connected to the network and to connectivity, we can talk about heterogeneity. Heterogeneity, let me talk about two things in here. Heterogeneity means the ideological spectrum that an MEP is able to cover. If I'm an MEP and I'm working together from the same MEPs from the same member state, from the same party group, then our power is minimal. If I'm able to build coalitions over EP groups, over member states, and to reach a higher, a broader outreach, then most likely I'm able to put the necessary power to get my amendments adopted. This is what heterogeneity is all about. We can talk in here the ideological spectrum, bridge betweenness, bridge closeness, which uh, shows how close the MEP is to other EP groups, or how close the MEP is, or how much, how many times the MEP is on the road that is connected to other EP groups. These all shows the ability of the MEP to build wide coalitions behind his policy agenda. Here are the top 10 overall ranking and the top 10 MEPs of the overall ranking. Here I would like to grab the opportunity to congratulate all of them. And of course I have to highlight uh, Mr. Dragos Pislaru who is present here with us uh, today. Um, you can see that Renew Europe, which is really a big bridge, a kingmaker in the European Parliament, is highly represented in the ranking but you can find the number one MEPs from the European People's Party, Green MEPs, Socialists as well. What we can learn, or what you can learn, from the report. For individual MEPs, as I told, the most active, the most uh, ideological heterogene, and the most connected members of the European Parliament. For committees, you can see the strongest committee, the strongest relationships between MEPs in the committee, and also, I mean, against committee members, and also the ranking of the coordinators, which is important. Coordinators play a key role 
in the, in the committee level legislation. Regarding EP groups, there's a separate chapter in the report for EP groups as well. You can see the most significant partner EP groups, a certain EP group is tying together, the strongest co-sponsoring uh, co relations, and also, as I made a reference to, the bridges, the critical MEPs who are bridging two different EP groups. And finally, for member states, you can see again the cross-member state, the cross-country co-sponsoring relations, and also you can identify which MEPs are the bridges between uh, the member states. What the data and the methodology could be used for? First and foremost in the center, it's good for almost 450 million European citizens. It's also a transparency issue, a transparency initiative. Um, European citizens can know what the MEPs are doing uh, in the European Parliament they have voted for or they voted for in 2019. Then it's a very useful and valuable tool for public affairs professionals. Using the methodology, using the data, you can identify the critical, important, influential members of the European Parliament overall and of course in a certain uh, policy area, in a certain EP committee. And last but not least, it's good for members of the European Parliament uh, in order to give them a tool how to increase their legislative influence within the European Parliament. What can we offer? We can offer a sectoral anal analysis, as I, as I told you. I mean, one sector is one EP group practically in the European Parliament. We can track a certain legislative dossier throughout the European Parliament, who are the most active, uh, most connected, and most ideologically heterogeneous MEPs. Uh, from 2022, we will launch quarterly EP reports which track the legislative activity of the European Parliament. And our mid- and long-term objective is also to make an even broader data set using data from other EU institutions, the Committee, the European Commission, and the, and the Council formations, in order to be able to track the legislative procedure throughout the three institutions. Of course, I'm talking about co-decision, the ordinary legislative procedure. I would like to thank you for your attention. I have a couple of slides more for the discussions later. If, uh, if it comes to the question, uh, then I will, I will go for them. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks, Attila. This was uh, very interesting. Results are extremely interesting. Uh, interesting. And I think, the, uh, your, I think it was third to last slide, which I found uh, particularly fascinating, is the, the application of these uh, findings. No? So as you say, it's a tool. I, had, uh, I read it over the weekend, and I could really see the three elements you outlined there. It is a tool we now have that gives citizens an overview of the legislative activities of the MEPs they voted for in 2019. So there's a bit of accountability around this first pillar. Second, it helps us, so all the one engaged in uh, EP, uh, overall EU advocacy, because we can better understand the MEPs that matter, influential, the ones that uh, are relevant, so the second aspect. And as you say, maybe, and we'll ask uh, Dragos in a minute, gives an MEP or the delegation, the EP group, a tool to increase their own legislative influence because they can assess their own performance, if I understand correctly, and they can also compare their performance with their political opponents. So um, to kick off the um, discussion now, I would uh, start with uh, you, Dragos. And uh, as Attila said, you scored really high. So uh, you are featured amongst the top 10, and uh, we, we have data later, but you also score high on the three criteria, no? So the, uh, the activity, connectivity, and heterogeneity. So congratulations. We looked into details, and apparently you sponsored 1,400 amendments. You also had, uh, uh, you worked together with more than 100 co-sponsor. You are a rapporteur on few files, shadow rapporteur on others. I won't list them. You are active in plenary activity discussion. So the first question is, how is it feasible? I guess you have 24 hours as the rest of us, so how do you do? Um, thank you, thank you very much, uh, and congratulations to Eolitics and to Otila. Um, you should uh, ask my wife about it. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it, it, it has 
uh, a very hectic period. Um, so I don't want to, to, to lie here. I've been very busy lately. Um, but I mean, it's very important to, for the citizens especially to know that uh, an MEP has resources. And I'm not talking about the revenue part because that's where we usually the discussion starts. It's, it's about what resources do you have in order to build up a proper team. So I would say that uh, to, a, to a great extent, the result that I'm, I'm having, the results that I'm having in the parliament and have been depicted here as well, are the result of the fact that I've actually pushed to the limit what a team in the parliament can look for an MEP. So I have uh, free uh, accredited assistance. Uh, I have two trainees all the time that are rolling, you know, each four months. I have free local assistance and a contracted uh, social media professional. So this is a team of 10. I've been in the you know, entrepreneurial world before with 10 people as a startup. Uh, I mean, you can do a, a lot of things. So I, I'm actually projecting this particular thing. You can think of a budget that goes in terms of you know, putting all the resources together, something like 350,000 euros per year, which is not much, not less. I mean, I think that you can do a lot of things. So, so this is a team effort. That's very, very important. Now, the, 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 second, the second thing that uh, you know, puts me uh, probably, uh, according to the methodology in the top, is that I am advantage as being of Renew. As a centrist group, uh, we can be the kingmaker, as, as uh, has been uh, said, by working uh, you know, and trying to form majorities either to our left or to our right. Uh, depending on uh, if uh, on the values that we are talking about, and again, renew as a centrist group, it's very much about values that are related to freedoms and you know individual rights and so on. That is more to the right part of the spectrum, and then when it comes to um, at the same time to community uh, and, and solidarity and access and opportunity, which allows us to do things at our at our left. Now, the second advantage that I have is that I am a um, coordinator. So by, by its very nature, the, the, the job of a coordinator is to do what is described here as being first, you know, uh, connectivity. That, that means to bring your people, you know, aligned on several issues. And again, it's not easy. For Renew, that's, that's really difficult. Um, and the third thing would be, uh, I mean, obviously as a, as a coordinator, I, I need also to, to deal with the heterogeneity aspect because we need to build up the majorities. And the third thing is that I've been on some special uh, files, like the RRF, Recovery and Resilience Facility file, and the TSI, the Technical, um, uh, technical Support Instrument. And, and, and these two were files in the time of pandemic where we needed a, you know, a really a procedure that we, go, we can move fast and have an overarching majority. So then, by exception, it was allowed to have three coordinators. Um, and, and that's, uh, sorry, free rapporteurs, free co-rapporteurs, sorry. Uh, so that means that from, from, from the outstart, uh, this needed to be consensual. And the, the kind of majorities that we got in the parliament for both files, for both the TSI and the RF, were unprecedented. If you look uh, in Econ Budge, uh, I, I, I mean, the, the kind of majorities that we were able to build is very important. Uh, and last, last thing from my side on, on this one, this is also on how you view your activity. So, okay, activity is volume and so on and so on. But then, what is the final purpose? The final purpose should not be about your ego to win a vote. The final purpose should be, can we deliver something meaningful to the citizens? And for that, you need to remember that you may win, you know, with a very tight majority, a particular vote. But if there will, you will have colleagues that you humiliate in the process as a rapporteur, um, or, or if you put them you know, to lose in every possible uh, you know, chance that they have to express their ideas, you, you will not be able to count on them next time. And they might retaliate when they will have the next opportunity. So the whole purpose is to try to bring an understanding in the parliament that is, this is not about some people winning in the parliament and other people losing in the parliament. This is about the citizens winning, and for that you need stable majorities. You need ways to have checks and balances, that is obviously the case, but at the same time to be able to connect in such ways that you are able to come up with initiatives and so on. And the last example that I want to give you, for instance, the resolution that I put forward on cross-border uh, workers uh, 
uh, in time of pandemics, we remember that there were cases uh, of, of abuse and exploitation. And I, I had the option of you know, having a group resolution and then each group tabled its own resolution and so on. But from the start, I said, this needs to be for it a large majority. This needs to be a joint motion resolution, which is not something that you can just say, I would like to have that. You need some sort of reputation that you can build those consensual approaches. And then the other groups realize that, OK, with this guy coordinating the, the thing, we might actually be able to have a consensual approach. So it's also about the kind of reputation. So thank you very much for building up on that. Uh, and I'm really grateful to, 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 to be a, a high scorer in your methodology. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dragos. It's, um, it's interesting. Basically, what I take out of this uh, answer is that it's not a solo work, no? It's not. Uh, so it's a teamwork. So when clients ask us, who should we, we, we meet? We say, yes, of course, MEP, but there, are, there is a team, as you say, behind. And you won't get a document or your amendment approved unless you work with others. So the heterogeneity, as you say, and the readiness to compromise and bring others with you if you want that uh, text to go um, uh, until plenary. So uh, just uh, if we can pause on the amendments, and maybe that's where Attila and Andras can come in. Um, so on the amendment, I wonder, what is the decision process? So. Um, what is the process you go through when tabling amendment? Are the personal consideration interests? Do you think about your constituency? Do you think about your party? Um, is it the file that uh, is interesting for you? So one is the decision process. And then how you concretely get the amendment passed? Because as we said, volume is something. So tabling amendment might not be that difficult. There is a new online system. But it's getting them through that, uh, that matters. And then the last question, and then you can jump in, is uh, amendment is part of a bigger, bigger picture, no? So where do amendments fit in your overall parliamentary work? There is written question, oral questions, on initiative report, we could go on forever. So three aspects on amendments, decision process, how to get them through, and then amendment in the wider scheme. Should we ask with um, Dragos first, and then? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to tell you anything new about what, what the process looks like. But what is important is that, you know, no MEP can know a particular topic better than the people that are working every day on those topics uh, and the people that are subject to the effects of those topics. So for that, um, this goes without saying that you need consultations. Um, when, whenever I was a rapporteur, and this is a practice that you can see, um, all the rapporteurs on files are supposed to consult the, uh, you know, the stakeholders, and if they can do citizen consultations as well, that this will be a top up on that. For instance, on the RRF file, I've been doing 13 consultations in the member states with BPES, with, with the uh, you know, offices of the European Parliament in those member states. Uh, they, they were very broad, social partners, student organizations, youth organizations, government. Um, and that was actually helping me to project, uh, you know, the kind of amendments that I would follow. Uh, and that, that is clear. Now, um, obviously, you can do that proactively when you know how to do it. And, you know, uh, clearly you can, you know, have your own setup. But on the other hand, you receive loads of emails uh, from <laughs> public affairs uh, specialists in different companies or NGOs and so on and so forth. So, so this is a process of going back and forth with, with you know, getting the, the, the right background information. Last but not least, in terms of um, how the amendment thing works, I mean, it would be really good uh, in your political group before uh, I mean, if you want to have a coordinated or a line thing, to have a proper consultation in, you know, and doing some preparatory work. That's why the prep meetings are so important. Because, I mean, it, it will allow you to understand that if you are going to put an, an, a particular amendment, is that amendment aligned somehow with what the other colleagues are going to say? Because just to table amendments for the sake of tabling them, that's not actually the point. The point is, do I have a chance to influence the debate on that? Um, and then you may also, part of the tactics, put some amendments with a, with a position that is more extreme to try to get actually to the position that would be more consensual and, uh, you know, and more, uh, let's say, uh, from an ideological standpoint, uniting, you know, more, more, uh, more uh, MEPs around. So, so the process in itself, it's, it's not rocket science, but it takes the usual skills, you know, transparency, openness, uh, 
the capacity to hear other other people's opinion, to like, a critical judgment in the sense that I always, for instance, analyze if there is something you know, behind a particular proposal that I'm receiving. I mean, if this is about, you know, not about uh, advocacy, but, uh, you know, sheer lobby of a particular concentrated group, and then I will obviously analyze if that particular amendment that may be the, uh, resulting from such a discussion is worth having or not. And, and again, uh, that's, that's uh, I think, part of, uh, of, of the process. Uh, this is, uh, this would be, a way to depict the process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Andras, from the public affairs perspective, any thoughts on the process that Dragos described? Or? I'm not sure I'm going to address all three points because we have heard a very, very extensive analysis firsthand from someone who is dealing with this every day. What I perhaps would like to highlight is, is the trend, the very fact of having this sort of analysis enter the public affairs scenery in Brussels because prior to this level of data analysis, what we saw was always a snapshot of events. And now we kind of see the video or we see the backstory. And from that, we can perhaps predict or at least anticipate a trajectory where certain amendment or a person's position might move into. The other aspect I think is, is the importance of, of weighing certain factors more than others and doing it with scientific rigor. So what you heard here is obviously you as MEP are subjected to so many lobbying, advocacy, influence efforts, and you yourself need to apply a certain filter, which one you give more credence and which one you may dismiss. And the process that you do certainly has a certain method to it based on the country you're from based on the political group that you represent, based on the, the committee that you sit in, based on your role inside the parliament, and then based on yourself as you, <laughs> the, the very background that you have, your studies, your, your, your cultural, and, and every other aspect of it. And bringing data to it a little bit lets the, 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 these interest representatives peek into that. Now, obviously, no one will have a perfect prediction, but I think using all those data points and trying to anticipate a little better than before a superficial image of your positions or other, other aspects, but really looking at which one might be more important than others. And that gives more opportunity to, to know whether they should try to influence you or someone else or others. Can I ask actually, still Andras, a question? You say, uh, and I agree, this, uh, this uh, report is revolutionary because we're now, uh, we now have solid data that can guide us, but how do um, public affairs professionals generate this sort of insight now? So, um, is it through your knowledge of the parliament uh, rather than empirical uh, analysis? How do we do nowadays? I think there's still a fairly a superficial approach to this. Fairly, and again, without this is not a judgment; it's more, more, more of an observation. We're looking at those characteristics, the many of the ones that I mentioned. But I think the true value here is weighing and adding an extra weight to say, uh, here in this particular MEP's case, the fact that they are sitting in that committee or, or which political group that is a more dominant factor on this particular file based on their voting records and based on their history. But perhaps tomorrow in a very different file, <laughs> that will be totally different. And, and adding those multipliers into the equation helps the public affairs professionals to choose from 705 MEPs which one is worth my time to try to lobby or influence. Thank you. Uh, actually, to Attila, um, so we talked about amendments, tabling, getting them through. So have you done any sort of analysis on the proportion of amendments that, um, that are passed? And uh, um, so is there, a, and the other question is, is there any sort of predictability that we could get out of your report? There is. And um, we have already data sets which shows the adoption rates of amendments and adoption of amendments. And here, theoretically speaking, or practically speaking, we can talk about three layers of adoption. Committee level, plenary level, and in case of co-decision, 
whether the amendment is part of the council and the EP adopted final uh, legislation. What we are concentrating on is the committee level, because this is the backbone, practically, of the legislation in the European Parliament. Um, we have data for the adoption. I mean, our model is uh, like a freemium model, something you can see for free, and something like a premium service. Um, but we can see uh, that there is something like, to put it very, very simply, and, and we can go into the methodological details if, if, if there's a need, that there is something like a 75% of predictive power that we can say which amendments will most likely be adopted at committee level. Some words uh, regarding the discussions and the remarks that you, that you started. Um, Point number one, there is no perfect methodology. The subjective element that Andras mentioned that MEPs are human beings there uh, in the plenary, in the committee, uh, they have their personal values, the national interests and party interests might be conflicting and there, there should be a choice made which one to, which one, which one to choose. You can never predict uh, fully the outcome of the legislation. This is one thing. But the more data you have, the more time frame you observe, the longitudinal analysis, the higher predictive power you might reach. What we have today is a good level already. It's a good level, but might be increased, should be increased in the future with channeling more and more data um, into, into, into the equation, as you, as you said. The other story is that not all the data which are important are quantifiable. Let me tell you that we are human beings. If two MEPs are dropping off their kids in the morning to the kindergarten, they might work together in the European Parliament. But how can you quantify that? How can you put it into the, uh, into the analysis with scientific rigor, if, uh, as, 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 as you said? You cannot put that into the equation. So there will be always a black hole. But the objective is to increase the predictive power of the, of the analysis. And it's possible. And it's underway. Practically, of course, one of the buzzwords of today is machine learning and artificial intelligence, but this is practically machine learning. Uh, from the past, you can predict somehow the future. I don't want to cite uh, uh, examples from football, uh, but what, if, if, if you see a football game, before the football, football game, you can hear that, I don't know, FC Barcelona beat Bayern Munich 10 times when, when they played in Barcelona and Messi was not on the bench, etc., etc., etc. And they predict that most likely, the winner of this game will be FC Barcelona. Uh, this is like sports betting. Um, that's a procedure. That's something similar to the procedure of the legislative uh, decision making. And we are optimistic to, to grab this in the future. Thank you. I won't comment on the football analogy, having won the, as Italian, the uh, championship, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm keeping the 75% uh, uh, number in my mind, which is really high, no? Predictability of 75% seems pretty high to me. It's, it, it's, a, good, but, uh, it's, it's a good start. Yeah. Um, as, 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 as time passes by, as more data will be available, we, ho we hope to increase this, um, this rate. Excellent. And I know, uh, Dragos, you'll have to leave soon to do the things, as I said, we are discussing. Uh, unless you want to react to any of uh, Andras or Attila, uh, comments. I have uh, just one qu last question. Um, so it's about uh, the constituency. So uh, are your, is your constituency aware that you are so active and you are doing all these brilliant things for, for the European Union? And uh, so do you get praise from the people that voted for you? And if not, should we use this report with your citizens to show that they voted for the right person? Yeah, so I will be very honest. Uh, um, I, I do believe that we need these kind of instruments to increase the transparency, uh, generally speaking, of the work that is done in the parliament, because I don't, be, I don't think that citizens are fully aware of what we are doing. So f for many of our European citizens, the European parliament is a black box. It's another institution that is doing stuff. Uh, they will hardly differentiate in between the Commission and the Parliament when it comes to legislative initiative, for instance. If you ask European citizens who is initiating legislation, it's not very clear that they will point to the Commission uh, or they're aware of the fact that the Parliament has limited rights uh, in limited possibilities to do that. But uh, what I want to say is that the people that are aware 
um, are, they are interested in that. They are following these kind of reports. And they will uh, you know, be pleased that they made a good choice uh, in 2019, or displeased um, if the case. Um, for me personally, just to put it at a personal level right now, for me, the, the mix in communicating about that is not to be arrogant and saying, oh, I am on the second place. I mean, this is for me not the purpose of my activity, but something that I see as resulting from what I'm doing. And if it's good, then it's okay. If it would have been bad, I would have asked questions and maybe have a meeting with my team and analyze what um, uh, has been uh, not that effectively. Um, and, and on the other hand, to try to communicate that um, there are some features that count. So that activity, for instance, is not the only facet of uh, an MEP activity, uh, but also the results and the effectiveness of the work. And if you put that together and the fact that um, um, you are also scored by other NGOs suggesting that you are influential and so on, then, then it might be in the end something useful for the next elections in 2024. Uh, or for your uh, political career, if that's the case. And I just wanted to add something, um, you know, before I'm leaving. Uh, by the way, I am leaving because I'm rapporteur on a very, very nice file, the European Digital Identity File, which is really something that we we will uh, discuss, uh, you know, uh, with with, uh, with some difficulty uh, to, to have a majority in the in the next months. But before that, I just wanted to, to highlight one additional thing related to the connectivity uh, and especially heterogeneity thing. We do have in the, in the parliament, we didn't have too many social events, unfortunately, because of the pandemics, but do, we do have the intergroups. And I realized that one of the things that I, I actually drove my, my, my team crazy is that I insisted at the beginning of my mandate to be part of several intergroups, children rights intergroup, disability intergroup, social economy intergroup, uh, youth intergroup, and so on and so forth. And those were opportunities to interact with people across the spectrum. So that's another thing that, that counts, basically, not to you know, stay there uh, in, in your own uh, uh, caucus and then uh, insulate it from, from what's happening outside your delegation group um, you know, uh, circle of, uh, of usual of usual work. So, so these are these are important things, and and, and I think that um, um, again we should congratulate Eolitix um, for the work done. Uh, and uh, for, from from my own side, I I am actually taking all the information uh, with with a lot of uh, you know curiosity, interest, uh, professional interest as well. So indeed, it's useful to MEP. Um, for MEPs, and, and I think that uh, um, this work should be done uh, uh, f further encouraged. And generally speaking, big data analytics, it's, 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 it's on the trend right now and should be applied for, for political analysis as well. So thank you so much for that. I'm going to rush right now in the ITRE committee for uh, having my speech, and thank you for having me um, invited at, uh, at this particular event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dragos Pislaro, and uh, good afternoon and good work. We'll keep going. Thank you. Thank you. So I will then move. And I think it is the right time to then uh, open up no, for, for questions. So I would invite the ones who are in the room to ask questions, to state your name um, and then uh, company and then uh, organization and then ask questions. Or even the ones who are online, because I will get your questions on my phone, apparently. So. I will see first if there is anyone in the room who has a question. Yes, there is one. Can I take my mask off? Can you hear me with my mask on? Sorry, mask on. Let's try if we can hear you. Yeah, can you hear COVID me? Rules for those with the mask on. Yes. yes. So thank you very much. Really very interesting presentation. I'm Megan Richards. I'm a senior advisor at Ruth Peterson. Uh, but I also I worked many years in the European Commission. So you will appreciate that I have a particular perspective on this. And having had to deal with 4,000 amendments on one, 3,000 amendments on another, anything that will help us, and not just in the commission, but the whole environment, to better analyze where these come from, why, et cetera, or even reduce the number of amendments, because I think this is also something that could be very useful for the parliamentarians, because you've seen the amendments too. You sometimes have 10 with only one word changed in each one of them. So, can you give me an idea of how this will also help to improve the quality of the amendments and concentrate them to make them fewer and more impactful? That's the first question, which of course data in theory should do. 
And second, of course, you've mentioned it and the MEP mentioned too, this is not just the parliament that's involved in legislation, of course. The co-legislators involve also the council. Parliamentarians from country X are, I mean, mar members of the European Parliament from country X are not necessarily having the same opinion as their representatives in the council. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, it all depends. And of course, the council also has an equal opportunity to comment and to make amendments and change the legislation. So will your analytical work also help in that context to give a better overview of how the two work together? And then the last point, of course, is that you can't completely change what the Commission has proposed in the first place. You, you can make amendments, you can adjust, but you can't deny exactly. Otherwise, it has to go back, the Commission has to re-submit. So that's not a question, that's just an observation. Okay. Um, let me start with the first one. Of course, um, when you see hundreds or, or thousands of amendments, I mean, point number one, each MEP has the right to table an, an amendment. For many amendments, it's just so to say signaling to the member states or to the constituency the MEP is coming from that, okay, I did my best and I did my utmost to table this amendment. From the very beginning, I know that it will change nothing. I just want to show my voters that I made this amendment that I believe in line what the interest of the constituency or the, or the member state is in order to put in the end, okay, I did my best, it was rejected, fine. Um, regarding the similar amendments, um, of course, it goes back to the question whether the same public affairs companies have approached number of amendments, at the, uh, number of uh, MEPs at the same time, and they haven't coordinated with each other, therefore, they are representing it 10 times. Um, with the amendments and the data set we have, we also have textual data. So practically we can see immediately if, if these, are the, the, these are the same. Uh, and let me, let me bring here another question that has already been touched upon. Um, what is the weight of the amendments um, in terms of uh, policy weight? For example, if it's tabled to the recital part of the, of the legislation, where, where there are beautiful sentences about the objective of the, of the, of the that doesn't count. Then there's an amendment tabled to the annex, which is referred to in the text, and in annexes there are the percentages, there are the entry into force, the ter territorial coverage, etc. That's another story. So if we can differentiate between the policy weight of the amendment. Another differentiation, and then I will, I will go to question two and three. Opinion giving committee, or committee responsible. Opinion giving committees, I mean 99.9% .9 of the amendments that are tabled there are rejected uh, at committee level. They are in the statistics, they are. They should do that, they should. Uh, but in the very end, they have very minimal influence on the, on the legislative outcome of the procedure. Um, what was the second question? Yes. Abadi? Council and Commission. Ro and the council. Yeah. Comes from I mean, uh, and the, the problem with the Council is that many working documents of the Council are not publicly available, point number one. Point number two, we already have data regarding Council voting um, that might be somehow channeled into the model. Third, um, there are, so to say, variables uh, connected to the members of the European Parliament, for example, regarding their um, previous um, um, career. Many MEPs used to work uh, in national governments before, therefore they have some sort of ties with the council and know how the council works. Or another variable, what we call same government. It's not the same whether an MEP in the European Parliament has his party in government at home, therefore the same interest might be represented in the European Parliament and in the council simultaneously. So the methodology could be, could be fine-tuned with these uh, variables and additional information. Um, last but not least, the, uh, the Commission. Regarding the Commission, two things. First, uh, there are, for, for the most important files, there are own initiative reports from the European Parliament before the Commission makes the official proposal. So those own initiative reports should be analyzed and observed with uh, particular attention. And then, in the, in the Commission side, 
there are data available regarding the public consultation before a certain file. And then you can analyze who is proposing what to the Commission and how they are reflected uh, then in the, in the official starting kickoff position of the European Commission. Thank you. Actually, when uh, you talked about the volume of amendments, I was thinking about the DSA, no? which is apparently one of the files who has received the most amendments, the Digital, Digital Service Act. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that was uh, there are over 2,000 amendments tabled. Um, a question to, before I read one from the um, online, uh, to you, Andras. So, um, so I, when I read the report, I thought, if I was a new skeptic, I would say that these are exactly the reports they would equip lobbyists with ammunition to then leverage MEPs and uh, uh, manipulate them no, at their advantage. So um, the idea of uh, obscure lobbying, no, which still exists somewhere, so could be no, uh, fueled by this kind of report. So what would you say for those who might have these doubts? Might. Rumor has it. It does empower anyone who uses this data. That's for sure. That's what data is for in this domain, that you get a certain advantage or a certain insight or some extra knowledge that will make you more influential. The point where I would perhaps challenge you or, or, or just give a different definition of lobbyist, where lobbyists typically understood as corporate interest uh, with a self-serving agenda, whereas it's more about advocacy that anyone can use this Certainly, if you have certain resources, as I'm not sure about the business model, but if it's a freemium, then probably there's some paid service there. But then again, NGOs, governments, patient organizations, trade associations, uh, consumer groups, uh, embassies, trade groups, all of these, well, they tend to have those resources. So it's not a prohibitive one, and advocates at large can access it. So it's not just uh, the corporations and those with deep pockets who can get this sort of insight. Thank you. So I'm reading the question from, is it uh, Lisa Lang? Um, so from the, so online, I'm reading it out. Is the myth true the, the first and last 100 days are the most productive? Considering we are in a half time before election and there are new ecosystems, uh, when is the right time to push? So as a representative of an association, when is the best time to approach an MEP? Before the election, just after the election? So, to both of you. I mean, if we compare the, the first report and, and, and this report, we don't see a significant uh, change in the, in the working load of the, of the European Parliament. Maybe because of uh, what also Mr. Pistol mentioned, because of the COVID. Uh, there was a very harsh and very uh, pushy agenda of the European Parliament that there was a big pressure on the European Parliament to get legislative amendments, legislative dossiers through the system. It doesn't seem uh, that, uh, that the first year was exceptional and then the second year they faded away and there was less activity in the European Parliament. For this current EP term, it's not true. I mean, we don't foresee what's happening at the end of this, um, uh, this EP term. But for analyzing the first two years, it's practically the same. And just Maybe just one comment on that. It probably has a lot to do with the Commission's agenda. When Commission in the new term tends to be obviously very ambitious, but towards the end of the legislative term, there are fewer initiatives coming out because they have less chance of getting passed in time. So, I mean, it's pretty much in sync with, with that. Thank you. What we notice is that towards the end of the uh, legislative term, there is a peak of, uh, of dossier that are just approved a few months before then there are new elections in Parliament. A question to you before then I ask another question to the audience. You're both Hungarians, I've just realized. Yeah. So, um, so how would you rate the Hungarian MEPs? I know there is a section in the report that uh, scores MEPs by nationality. So I know Italians tabled 13,000 amendments, apparently, over the last year. Uh, so, in your report and uh, your, your views uh, just on your daily activity dealing with the Hungarian MEPs. I mean, regarding the Hungarian MEPs, um, the, the picture is mixed. Um, Adam Kosha is, is, is one of the, I mean, practically the, the only MEP in the top 50 in the overall ranking. Last year, it, uh, I mean, he's from, from Fidesz, the EPP now um, independent. Um, last year, uh, Katalin Che was in the, in the top 50 um, from the Renew Europe group. Similarly, uh, today, uh, Che Katalin, or Katalin Che, um, is the number one Hungarian MEP regarding connectivity. 
Um, so it, uh, it also substantiate the position that Renew Europe is something like an intermediary or kingmaker in the, in the business. But there are um, SND MEPs who are, who are ranked on the top, uh, Klara Dob Dobrev, um, Istvan Uyheyi, um, and also some other guys uh, from, the, from the Fidesz, for example, Trochani was, uh, was very highly ranked uh, in his committee. So the picture is, uh, the, so the picture is mixed, practically. Yeah, I, I think it's it's very individual. I think it's much less linked to the actual party that they, that they sit in, but just some MEPs, mostly the ones you mentioned, those four or five, they tend to be pretty active by nature. They are just, their personality is, is that they are connectors, they are socialites, they are politically ambitious, and that, that determines. But I'm also Belgian, and I won't comment on the Belgian MEP. Equally, equally. And, and let, let, let me say just one sentence, maybe, uh, to, to put it in the, into the big picture. I mean, legislative activity is one slice of the activity of the MEP. We have seen in history that one Twitter remark or, or, or message could be more influential than 1,000 amendments, I mean, in politics or in legislation. So when taking into account the activity of, the, of, of an MEP, it's work political work in the group, legislative work, what we can quantify, work together in the constituency with voters, etc., etc., etc. So this is only one slice, but we can quantify that, and, and it's an important and even more important uh, element given the co-decision and the ordinary, leg ordinary legislative procedure. So an integrated campaign, no? That's what uh, yeah. I get from uh, Attila. Maybe just to comment on that, you know, it, it makes me think, and it's a very interesting idea there. You started your presentation saying what you are actually measuring is the legislative influence. Yeah. And I think for most, uh, let's say, industry lobbyists or those affected by the sort of industry-facing issues, certainly consumer groups and, and, and other citizen groups, for them the legislative impact is obviously the major target. That's what they want to look at. But as you just said, it can go way beyond that. So if your aim is to raise awareness of a certain issue in Denmark, then I look at Stefan, perhaps a Danish MEP can be very influential in terms of setting the agenda on the national level without having much legislative impact in the European Parliament. So it largely depends on what your advocacy goal is, whether it's to change a draft legislation or legislation that's being, being discussed, or perhaps something different around that in a political realm. The big question is how you can collect data from that. For example, in the social media, you can collect uh, data from Facebook, Twitter, to a limited extent. And then you might quantify some sort of impact. And another question that I would like to, to bring here, that's also the question of reelectability. How much all these issues that we are analyzing will have an impact on the re-election, renomination and re-election of a certain MEP? Um, therefore, there are there are different types to analyze and different fields um, to be analyzed in the future. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple more from the audience online. So from uh, Tobias Jensen. So with a focus on activity, might the report reward very busy MEPs too much? How does the report also show they are influential? And then Claudia Rossi, you mentioned a, a coordinator ranking. How does it work exactly? And by the way, the report is available online on yes, yes. Uh, Eulytics EU. Um, okay, regarding the coordinator rankings, this is, this is the easiest. Uh, we know the party coordinators in each EP committees, and then the overall ranking of those MEPs who are coordinator, coordinators at the same time are the, 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 the top three. Of course, we are always going for the top five, three, fifty, because we would like to highlight somehow the MEPs and not want to uh, published the, the last one who is, I don't know, doing nothing in the European Parliament. Um, so the coordinator rankings can be found in each section of the, of the EP um, committees. Regarding the activity, um, we have weighted now uh, by the number of co-sponsors. If I'm alone, then I got one. If we are two, then we, then we each got half, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, that goes to the question of the devaluation of amendments once 20 MEPs are co-signing something just to show up my name on the list of MEPs co-sponsoring a certain MEP. But then subjective decisions should be taken. Can I say that the amendments which are co-sponsored by more than five MEPs are sorted out from the analysis? Based on what am I saying that if I, if, if I do so? Also, as I, I would like to, to get back to the point that we can also 
uh, make a different weighting regarding opinion giving committees, responsible committee. We can also make a different weighting regarding own initiative reports, budgetary amendments, co-decision amendments by the legislative type. So it's a very complex issue. Um, and there is no one definite rule we can apply. Um, now, we highlighted the, amen, uh, the MEPs which are more individualistic, so they are working alone, we give them one. But there could be another approach applied when we say, okay, each and every MEP out of 20. The, the question is whether it's fair to those who are taking the lead or fair to those who are putting their names on the, on the list. Thank you. And to make a complex simple, so, um, so let's imagine, just to bring it down, we are now almost one, uh, two. So uh, let's say I'm a stakeholder. There is a file in ITRE, so the digital decade policy program. And I need to understand how, who, who to contact. So uh, should I look at the page in the ITRE committee out of the report? Well, actually, Andras, how would you use this report if you have a file which is going to be debated in a committee and you don't know who to contact? How would this uh, report be useful in practice? for stakeholder, what would you take? Sounds like a pretty good idea to me. I think before that, nevertheless, you might want to ask yourself, do I want to change that piece of legislation? So is that my, my primary goal here? Chances are yes. So you want to then find those who have a certain impact on that file, and certainly you want to go to those who have the biggest impact on that particular file. And in, in for this highly practical application, the report is perfect because then you look at those rankings according to the different metrics and then you can try to, to approach. But then you probably want to ask yourself the question, do I have access to that person? Very, very good question. That's two different questions to identify an important influential MEP and whether that MEP is willing to represent and channel a certain policy agenda into, under his name into the whole legislative procedure. May I just show two more files uh, from my presentation? Because you mentioned ITRA if you have 30 seconds more. Just to, I mean, this is the ITRA committee of the current EP term. That's, an, that's a completely under, uh, another uh, methodological tool based on the network. This is called Weighted Top Candidate. And you can see that, I don't know, Paolo from Portugal, Christoph from France, etc., etc., etc. That's also another approach that could be applied on, uh, on uh, social networks. That's based on the assumption what MEPs, other MEPs consider influential. Therefore, they would like to tie with them in order to boost their legislative influence. And the last one I, would, I wanted to say, this is about voting data. Como agree, but it could be done for all EP committee. This is the so-called Bands of Power Index. To put it simply again, it is based on the critical vote of the MEP. What is critical vote? You don't need to lobby those who will vote against the proposal. You don't need to lobby those who are voting for the proposal. You need to lobby the undecisive ones in the middle which will change with their vote or which will decide with their votes whether it's rejected or adopted. This is also another methodology based on another data set. Thank you. It is uh, almost two. One final word from each of you, and then we'll wrap up this interesting session. So, expectation has been fulfilled, at least from my side. Andras, last word. I think this is really the, the trend in the future where, where we're headed, and it helps you allocate your resources in the best possible way. So, use these tools and uh, use the methods instead of intuition that has a role. But the weight of it is increasing, <laughs> and the power of data is increasing. First of all, I would like to thank uh, my team for making this, uh, this report possible. First and foremost, Levante, who is the lead, lead data scientist of, of EULITIX, but also Petra and Daniel, who are joining us online, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we are at the beginning, or a little bit more than the beginning of the road, but we have many innovative ideas or, or of uh, how to make this approach tool be more perfect for the benefit of the citizens, for the benefit of public affairs uh, professionals, and also to the benefit of the, of the members of the European Parliament. So this is the kickoff event, but uh, I'm very positive that we will continue. More thank you ahead. very much. Thank you both. So um, thank you So those who were in the room today. Thank to the ones who joined online. Obviously, thank you to uh, Attila Kovacs, Andras Bennett, and Demi Pislaru who left. And uh, so my 
three takeaways. No, there are always three takeaways. I have to be three. So uh, uh, listening to you, I thought one is that applying big data to the policy making field is truly revolutionary. So congratulations to you, Attil and team. Second, we, uh, public affairs practitioners, we can be more effective in devising our strategies by using this report. Um, but third is human factor is there and is there to stay. So, so um, obviously data will help us, but we shouldn't forget all the human components that also the MEP talked about. So as Attila said, get in touch with him directly. If you want to know more about the report, if you want their support, our support, we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.